Okay, I think the first thing we should do um, is thank Bren and Kimberly for all their hard work and putting this thing together. I, I, can't, I can't believe they're still standing, but actually they're not standing. <laughs> so so that I, can, I can handle that a little bit better. Um, so just two things. Uh, you were saying Donna's work has, has come up a lot in the conference. Uh, something that's coming out in the Post Humanity series in the fall that I've told a couple of you about um, that you might be interested in is a, is a book called Manifestly Haraway that uh, is the Cyborg Manifesto, the Companion Species Manifesto, and then uh, when I was in California last May, we did about a five-hour conversation between the two of us about the manifestos and about her work uh, and contextualizing her work um, uh, in context that some of which really didn't exist or weren't codified um, when the first manifesto was published. For example, what's now called biopolitical thought. So um, not all five hours is going to show up in the book, but I guess the conversation will probably be 40 or 50 pages. Um, and a lot of interesting things come up in the in the uh, conversation between the two of us that I think make, makes the manifestos look different. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be out in the fall. <coughs> um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, part of a project that started out uh, as part of a book called Wallace Stevens' Birds, because um, I'm talking about birds today. Uh, but the Stevens material is still part of it. This is blown up into a larger project about broadly ecological poetics, I would say. I don't know if there'll be two separate books or one book, but I just want you to be aware of that context. If you're in Bern next weekend and you're allowed to go, and you can ask Manuela Rossini if you're allowed to go or not, um, I'm actually going to be giving some of the Stevens material up there. So if you're in the neighborhood, drop on in and you'll see how this connects with the Stevens stuff. So <coughs> without further ado, I want to I want to start with an assertion that will seem paradoxical to some people and commonsensical to others. Extinction is both the most natural thing in the world and at the same time is never and never could be natural. On the one hand, 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed in the history of this planet are extinct. On the other hand, extinction can hardly be regarded as natural in any simple sense, and not just because, as a number of people have argued, nature, quote unquote, conceived as some realm apart, untouched and unshaped by human affairs, ceased to exist a long time ago as all the talk about climate change in the Anthropocene makes clear. Beyond this, <coughs> the psychoanalytically inclined among us point out that any human registration of the so-called fact of nature is always already radically denaturalized because the symbolic and imaginary realms that register the presence of nature in their different ways for us are anything but natural. As Zizek put it, now 25 years ago, and that sounds weird to say this, but as, as he put it 25 years ago, quote, the fact that man is a speaking being means precisely that he is, so to speak, constitutively derailed, <clears throat> an open wound of the world, as Hegel put it, that, quote, excludes man forever from the circular movement of life, so that all attempts to regain a balance between man and nature, unquote, can only be a form of fetishistic disavowal. One way to double down, as Jeffrey Nealon would put it on this assertion, is to realize that everything Zizek says does not apply only to human beings, because we aren't the only speaking beings in the broad sense of the term, even as we cannot say in any neat and simplistic way which non-human forms of life fall under the purview of this assertion and which do not, a desire for conceptual purification which would be its own form of fetishistic disavowal, as Derrida, among others, has pointed out. And a way to double down even more on the point is to take seriously Derrida's counterintuitive and indeed seemingly outlandish insistence that, quote, each time something dies, it's the end of the world, not the end of a world, but of the world, of the whole world, of the infinite opening of the world. And this is the case for no matter what living being, from the tree to the protozoa, from the mosquito to the human, death is infinite. It is the end of the infinite, the finitude of the infinite, unquote. Now, as we'll see in a moment, <coughs> this seemingly brazen assertion can be redescribed in more naturalistic terms that make it seem a lot less counterintuitive and help to draw out the fact that what's going on here is not just an excessively Heideggerian hangover on Derrida's part. Rather, he's trying to move us from what he calls the dogma of Heidegger's famous or infamous investigations of the differences between humans, animals, and stones to the inescapable necessity of paying attention to the different ways of being in the world. 
And it's on those differences that the hard and detailed ethical and political questions of thinking about extinction depend. It's difficult to generalize then about ex extinction, and it's even difficult to generalize about it when we limit ourselves to the class of creatures called birds, as we'll see now in two recent art installations I want to discuss, one on the California condor and one on the passenger pigeon. The first exhibition, opening in the fall of 2014 at the Arizona State University Art Museum, is a project by Mark Wilson and Brenda Snabjorn's daughter called Trout Fishing in America and Other Stories, which centers on current conservation efforts in and around the Grand Canyon area of the Colorado River that focuses mainly on two species, a not so well-known fish called the humpback chub and the California condor, which is a very famous bird indeed, having the largest wingspan, nearly 10 feet, of any bird in the world, rivaled only by the trumpeter swan in size and weight and often living to 60 years old or more. California condors actually became extinct in the wild in 1987 when the remaining 22 individuals were captured and an ambitious conservation program was launched. In 1991, they were reintroduced in the wild, and as of October 2014, the total world population stood at 425 birds, either in the wild or captivity, making it one of the world's rarest birds. Wilson and Snabjorn's daughter's amb ambitious exhibition consists of several different, el different elements but the one I'll focus on today, <coughs> for lack of time, is a series of photographs of the dead bodies of 14 California condors, each with a transcribed text about the bird taken from a, from, from, a concert, from a conversation with one of the biologists working in the conservation program. These birds were retrieved from a freezer at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and most of them died from lead poisoning, feeding on animals killed by hunters with lead bullets. When I went to give a talk in conjunction with the opening of the show, I was immersed in Derrida's second set of seminars on the beast and the sovereign, and to me these images called forth in a line that ends Paul Ceylon's poem, Vast Glowing Vault, which Derrida returns to again and again in the seminars. The line is, the world is gone, I must carry you. Ceylon's poem begins, vast glowing vault with a swarm of black stars pushing themselves out and away. Onto a ram's solicified forehead, I brand this image between the horns. Now many things could be said about the relation between these lines and the condor images, but in the limited space and time I have here, I wanna pursue an invitation suggested by the vault of the poem's title and how it might be linked to the vault from which the condor bodies themselves have emerged, a vault that pushes inward, not outward, as it were, to be placed before us in what strikes me, at least in some of these images, as a funereal setting or a scene of exhumation, an invitation to raise a question central to Derrida's seminars and central to my response to these images. Namely, what do we call these bodies before us? Are they corpses, remains, or are they just objects, like a rock, a table, or a leaf? And if not, if they are remains, what are they remains of? To whom or to what do they belong? And what, in turn, is owed to them? To address these questions is to unavoidably ask, as Derrida does, quote, what do beasts and men have in common, unquote. And central to Heidegger's dogmatic response, as Derrida puts it, is his well-known assertion that animals perish, but only human beings die, because human beings, unlike animals, have an understanding of death as such. They grasp their own mortality and live in the light of it in a way that eludes the animal, who at the end of its life simply ceases to exist biologically. And yet, as Derrida wonders in many places, do human beings really have this kind of relationship to death as such, one that would allow this apparently radical form of finitude to be reappropriated as what he calls a being able, a power, or a potency? Isn't it the case, rather, that we can never know the as such of death because death is always elsewhere and at a distance for us, even though it is, paradoxically, the thing that most testifies to our concrete and unique existence, our singularity. After all, <coughs> you can't experience your own death. You can only experience death in and through the death of the other. And all attempts to imagine or think about death are always, as Derrida points out, phantasmatic, as he puts it. And this suffices all the less, he continues, and I'm quoting now, to distinguish clearly between death as such and life as such, 
because all our thoughts of death are always structurally thoughts of survival. To see oneself or to think oneself dead is to see oneself surviving, present at one's death, unquote. What Derrida is emphasizing here is not the finitude referenced by Heidegger, the confrontation with my mortality and his famous existential of being toward death, but rather what we might call the finitude of my finitude, its non-appropriability for me and by me, its radical alterity, one that sets up a relationship of asymmetrical, unpredictable, and finally unappeasable alterity to the other. Thus he writes, death means above all, quote, to be exposed or delivered over with no possible defense, once totally disarmed to the other, unquote. And so the other for Derrida names, quote, what, might, what always might one day <coughs> do something with me and my remains, make me into a thing, and do so, moreover, as they wish, as he puts it. To put it this way is to realize that this relationship of alterity and incalculability to the other is, without let up and without assurances, indeed because without assurances, a scene of ethical responsibility. And that's precisely the situation into which we are thrust, I would suggest, by these images. What shall we do with these remains that are delivered over to us? What will we make of them? And what will that make of us? Here, I think, it's helpful to augment <coughs> Derrida's insistence on the alterity of other forms of life by redescribing it in terms of biological systems theory. But before I do that, we need to follow the, la the penultimate term, excuse me, in Derrida's argument to come back now to the last line of Ceylon's poem, which is made up of a movement through three po possible theses finished off with a meditation on the last one. And this is kind of a long quotation from Derrida. Thesis one, <coughs> excuse me, thesis one, incontestably animals and humans inhabit the same world, the same objective world, even if they do not have the same experience of the objectivity of the object. Thesis two, incontestably animals and humans do not inhabit the same world, for the human world will never be purely and simply identical to the world of animals. Thesis three, in spite of this identity and this difference, neither animals of different species, nor humans of different cultures, nor any animal or human individual inhabit the same world as another. And the difference between one world and another will remain always unbridgeable, because the community of the world is always constructed, simulated by a set of stabilizing apparatuses, nowhere and never given in nature. Between my world and any other world, there is first the space and time of an infinite difference, an interruption that is incommensurable with all attempts to make a passage, a bridge, an isthmus. All attempts at communication, translation, trope, and transfer that the desire for a world will try to pose, impose, propose, stabilize. There is no world, there are only islands." Unquote. Now, it's the first thesis, <coughs> as you all probably have guessed, that's usually taken to be ecological. But my point here is, by the logic we're now tracing, it's actually the third thesis that is the most radically ecological, or even better, we might say, environmental. Derrida's assertion might seem counterintuitive, but it will seem less so if we remember that in the terms of biological systems theory, there is no world precisely for the reasons we may trace back to the, wor the work of Jakob von Uxkel on human and animal umwelten and forward to the, to the work on biology of consciousness and cognition by people such as Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, who, demonstrates that what counts, who demonstrate that what counts as world is always a product of the contingent and selective practices deployed in the embodied inaction of a particular autopoetic living system. As philosopher of mind Alba Noe argues, quote, the locus of consciousness is the dynamic life of the whole environmentally plugged in person or animal, unquote. And as his work shows, recent research in the biology of consciousness makes it clear that these questions do not neatly break along the lines of human versus animal, inside versus outside, brain versus world, or even for that matter, organic versus inorganic. As Noe puts it, quote, it's not the case <coughs> that all animals have a common external environment, because to each different form of animal life, there is a distinct corresponding ecological domain or habitat, unquote, which means, as he puts it, that all animals live in structured worlds. 
Now I think we're in a better position to follow Derrida as he moves rapidly in the next moment of the seminar from an equally bracing phrase taken from Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, the phrase, I am alone, to Ceylon's memorable line, which we've already quoted, the world is gone, I must carry you. As Derrida puts it <coughs> in a later session that year, picking up the thread, quote, we could move for a long time between Fort and Da, Da and Fort, between these two theirs, between Heidegger and Ceylon, between on the one hand the Da of Dasein, and on the other hand Ceylon's Fort and Die Welt ist Fort. The world has gone, in the absence or distance of the world, I must, I owe it to you, I owe it to myself to carry you, without world, without the foundation or grounding of anything in the world, without any foundational or fundamental mediation, one-on-one, -on -one, like wearing mourning or burying a child, basically where ethics begins, unquote. Though I cannot pursue the point in detail here, it's worth noting that this scene of responsibility generated by the absence of world not the lack of world, but the absence of world, this goes back to the end of Derrida's famous essay, Difference, is also a scene of what is sometimes called spectrality or hauntology, a scene of responsibility to those already gone, wearing mourning, or those not yet here, bearing a child. Now it's possible, <coughs> I think, to give a scientific account of how this hauntology or spectrality obtains in our relations to the living and to questions of extinction, an account that we're invited to pursue by remembering that paying attention to the non-generic character of the system-environment relationship for particular creatures is in fact quite consonant with Derrida's insistence on what he calls complicating, thickening, delinearizing, folding, and dividing the line, unquote, that distinguishes different forms of life a move away, away from simplicity, namely the simplicity of the ham-fisted distinction human versus animal, and toward complexity, namely the non-generic complexity of the system-environment relation is that evolves both ontogenetically and phylogenetically, and a complexity that is, in principle, to use Derrida's term, infinite. Indeed, as theoretical biologist and MacArthur fellow Stuart Kaufman argues, the world is enchanted, that's his word, not mine, <clears throat> the world is enchanted precisely because there are no entailing laws that govern in Newtonian fashion the evolution of the biosphere and its various forms of life. As Kaufman puts it, even before we reach the level of what he calls Kantian holes, such as California condors and passenger pigeons, we have to ask, and this is a long quote from him now, <clears throat> we have to ask, has the universe in 13.7 billion years of existence created all the possible fundamental particles and stable atoms? Yes. Now consider proteins. These are linear sequences of 20 kinds of amino acids that typically fold into some shape and catalyze a reaction or perform some structural or other function. A biological protein can range from perhaps 50 amino acids long to several thousand. The typical length is 300 amino acids long. Then let's consider all possible proteins of length 200 amino acids. How many are possible? Each position in the 200 has 20 possible choices of amino acids, so there are 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times, or 20 to the 200th power, which is roughly 10 to the 260th power possible proteins of length 200. Now let's ask if the universe can have created all these proteins since its inception 13.7 billion years ago. There are roughly 10 to the 80th particles in the known universe. If they were doing nothing but making proteins on the shortest possible time scale in the universe, the Planck time scale of 10 raised to the negative 43 seconds, it would take 10 raised to the 39th power times the lifetime of our universe to make all possible proteins of length 200 just once. In short, <coughs> in the lifetime of our universe, only a vastly tiny fraction of all possible proteins can have been created. This means profound things. First, the universe is vastly non-ergotic. It is not like a gas at equilibrium in statistical mechanics. With this vast non-ergosity, when the possibilities are vastly larger than what can actually happen, history enters, and of course, environment enters. Of course, <coughs> Kaufman argues, and I haven't checked the math on this, by the way, I'm just taking his word, okay. 
just disclaimer. Of course, Kaufman argues <coughs> this principle obtains even more radically at the level of Kantian holes, and from this vantage, what we confront in the bodies of these dead condors is precisely a materialized trace of the process that he describes, whose inscrutability haunts the present with retentions from an evolutionary past and protensions of an evolutionary future, whose radical alterity resides in the fact that they are constituted by a complexity of recursive system environment relations that are in principle, as Kaufman argues, infinite, to use Derrida's term. Nevertheless, and I've explored this question in some detail elsewhere, namely in Before the Law, <coughs> in the face of this complexity and infinitude, we're forced to make decisions all the time without foundational or fundamental mediation about the letting die and about the killing of various forms of life, human and non-human. And this leads to the final and far from trivial point about the animals foregrounded by this installation, that these bodies before us are part of an archive, one enmeshed in a complex landscape of legal, political, and scientific forms of power knowledge, what Derrida calls those stabilizing apparatuses that simulate the sure and steady existence of a world in the face of the complexities that we and Kaufman have just outlined. For as he points out, quote, this is Derrida, there are no archives without political power. And the archive is thus a kind of mise-en-scene of, quote, two principles in one, the principle according to nature or history, there where things commence, physical, historical, or ontological principle, but also the principle according to the law, there where men and gods command, there where authority, social order are exercised, in this place from which order is given, unquote. As it is with the archive, so it is with extinction. On the one hand, there's nothing more natural. It's an event that happens there in nature. But at the same time, extinction is and can never be a natural event because it always takes place within a horizon or world and its organizing and governing principles that we create through stabilizing apparatuses. But that stabilization is always marked by something else that's preserved in the archive, maybe, maybe even mainly preserved. What Derrida calls <coughs> the a destination or destinerance that attends any attempt to make good on our ethical and political commitments, to materialize our world, to address the other to whom we feel ethically responsible. An a destination that stems from the fact that the same sign or trace or mark can function variably even oppositely in different environments, different contexts. The constraints of scientific method and protocol constitute, of course, a canonical attempt to control, even eliminate, this destinerance. But its most compelling manifestation in this installation is the lead bullet that leaves its trace, sometimes in the discoloration of the animal's body by lead poisoning, but sometimes invisible in these bodies, but not of them, you might say the materialization of two theirs in one place. That destinerance quite literally attends such tidy ethical and legal and political distinctions as we like to make between the polar opposites of game or trash animals who are deemed killable but not murderable, the animals that sustain these, these condors who are carrion feeders, <coughs> and those who, like the condor, are rare and threatened and protected with the full backing of scientific and political apparatuses. The archive may record the official story of body weight, reproductive, body weight, reproductive rate, legal status, and so on, but it also actualizes something more. And in that other space, that other scene, we discover that the world is not given, but made. We discover, in short, a scene of responsibility. <coughs> I want to move on now, shift gears a little bit to talk about this guy, Michael Pestel, uh, who's involved in this photograph and doing an interactive uh, performance piece, improvisational performance piece uh, in an aviary. He's done a bunch of these with birds. He plays different instruments. He's trained as a composer and, uh, and musician. And I want to talk about his installation, Requiem Ectopistus Migratorius, also mounted in the fall of 2014, which centers not just on a different species of bird, the passenger pigeon, the centennial of whose extinction the installation memorializes, but also the specter of a single bird, Martha, the last of her kind, that's stuffed Martha, the last of her kind who died in a display in the Cincinnati Zoo on September 1st, 1914. Now in a longer discussion, there will be much to say about this curious fact, namely dating the extinction of an entire species to a particular day, 
but I'll begin by noting that the centrality of Martha marks the extinction event of this particular species and Pestle's installation as something qualitatively quite different from the California condors of Wilson and Snabion's daughter. At the center of Pestle's extremely complex installation is a lar large round wooden structure called Martha's Peel. The term peel referring here not to a covering or its removal, but to the small square defensive towers of the sort that were built in the 16th century in the border counties of England and Scotland, here mimicked <coughs> by the 12 feet high by 8 feet diameter uh, wooden structure resembling a large bird cage, which has a rotating stool at its center and a video camera mounted on top to record the activities of those who inhabit the structure. Martha's peel is paired with two other components that stand across from it. Passenger is a wooden train trestle about 20 feet long supporting a modified O-scale train uh, with a car that moves back and forth across its length, casting a shadow both inside and outside the trestle. And viewers, invi viewers are invited to sight down the length of the trestle as the train moves. Peel's foe consists of a long palindrome that sits above the train trestle inscribed on slate panels reading, Peel's foe, not a set laminate, Peel's foe, not a set animal, laminates a tone of sleep, unquote. And Pestle's long been fascinated with palindromes and, and anagrams and so on and uses them in his work. These elements reference two of the three main factors that contributed to the passenger pigeon's extinction, the rifle and the railroad, which are alluded to not just by the O-scale train, but also by the viewer sighting down the interior of the train trestle as down the barrel of a gun. The role of the rifle will become clear enough in a moment, but the railroad played a major role in transporting, transporting large hordes of hunters to the migratory roosting sites, and crucially with the invention of refrigerated cars, which allowed the transportation of fresh squab meat, as it was called, to urban centers. The third main factor in the pigeon's demise, the invention of the telegraph, allowed masses of hunters to be, to be alerted as to roosting locations. And the telegraph, and specifically its iterability, is linked in the exhibition to writing, pecking, and musical notation, and of course the iterability of birdsong itself in numerous ways, which include an element called flugel, catalog of extinct birds, a cluster of elements including a grand piano, <coughs> a musical composition, that alg algorithmically translates the Latin names of almost 200 species of extinct birds into corresponding musical phrases, and a large collection down in the lower left-hand corner, uh, a large collection of, of piano cluster boards, or PCBs, which use spaced wooden dowels that, when placed down on the keys, automatically play the corresponding musical phrases. An element called erasure, <coughs> which consists of a video of the names of extinct birds being written on a chalkboard and then erased, which is shown on a small video screen mounted above Martha's Peel that can only be viewed, it's up in the upper right-hand corner, that can only be viewed through bird-watching binoculars. And three piano harps, one of which incorporates a 1914 Oliver typewriter uh, as part of the instrumentation that viewers play to generate a sound field, for a looping video of a dancing bird named Pigeon Number 98. And clearly the shape of the piano harps uh, and also the shape of the typewriter mechanism itself recall the wings of a bird. Also, in the rows of letters mounted on the glass wall at the entrance of the exhibition, which I'll come back to in more detail later, and finally in the performances of Pestle himself at various times during the exhibition, which include improvisation on, large hand, on a large handmade wooden recorder called the bird machine, which is a remarkable thing that incorporates a row of various bird calls mounted to the side and various baffles that he plays uh, in performance, uh, and also on a flute that he plays that fires wadding of the sort used in musket-loading ri muzzle-loading rifles into a gong mounted on one of the piano harps uh, standing on one side of the exhibition. So there's a lot going on in this exhibition. It's incredible. <coughs> what we find, uh, we find a lot of stuff, but some of the stuff we find is an extremely complex conjugation of the relationship between time, space, and how those are related to questions of code, iterability, technology, notation, and the disposition and articulation of the body and performativity, all of which is in turn framed by the relationship of singularity and multiplicity that figures here quite differently from what we find in the story of the California condor. 
Indeed, what structures the story of the extinction of the passenger pigeon is the poignant contrast between the singularity of Martha, the palsied 29-year-old sterile sole survivor of her kind, and what the species itself was most known for, flocks that, according to the estimate of none other than John James Audubon, could number over a billion birds and were said to darken the skies for days at a time. As Anita Albus recounts Audubon's experience in her beautiful book on rare birds, <coughs> and I'm quoting her now, and she quotes Audubon in this passage. Not one pigeon would land unless some of their millions of fiery red eyes could spy some woods with beech mast or acorns or fields of wheat or rice for their millions of pitch black bills. If a falcon tried to seize a bird in the flock, the pigeons quickly closed ranks into a compact mass generating a roll of thunder with their beating wings. Like a living torrent, they plunged down in almost solid masses and darted forward in undulating and angular lines, descended and swept close over the earth with inconceivable velocity, mounted perpendicularly so as to resemble a vast column, and when high, were seen wheeling and twisting with their continued lines, which then resembled the coils of a gigantic serpent. That's a quote from Audubon. Moved by the beauty of the spectacle, she writes, this painter of birds observed how one flock after the other would fly into the space where a pigeon had just escaped a falcon's talon, and how, even if no raptor were present, they would form a living river in the air and rep replicate the angles, curves, and undulations of the attached flock before them. A single memory bonded millions of pigeons together, unquote. I'll come back later, <coughs> briefly, to the theoretical register of this swarm-like or kind of superorganism behavior, but it should be noted that practically speaking, this strategy of predator satiation, as it's called, is precisely what enabled the passenger pigeon's rapid demise once all the necessary technological ingredients were in place. In his, orn in his ornithological biography, Audubon recounts the various strategies employed to produce the mass carnage that led to the passenger pigeon's extinction. Various sorts of firearms were used, of course, but also large pole and net contraptions that would garner thousands of birds at a time. Sulfur pots generated fumes that would asphyxiate birds by the thousands. Trees were felled as tens of thousands of nests and nestlings fell to the ground, and birds were poisoned with whiskey-soaked corn so that they could be rounded up easily, just to name some of the more tried and true strategies. Some Native Americans who had partaken of pigeon flesh as part of their subsistence for years found these methods disturbing, to say the least. Potawatomi leader Pokagan, disgusted by one 1880 massacre he had witnessed, wondered about what sort of punishment in the afterlife would be, quote, awaiting our white neighbors who have so wantonly butchered and driven from our forest these wild pigeons, the most beautiful flowers of the animal creation of North America, unquote. Both of these, the scene of slaughter and the moral indignation, are depicted <coughs> in a famous scene in James Fenimore Cooper's The Pioneers, published in 1823, a novel that is a call to judgment, as Jerome McGann has recently argued, about the treatment of, quote, other species, other native peoples, recorded in Cooper's work, unquote. As the massive flocks of passenger pigeons descend upon the fictional town of Templeton, the people of the village are whipped into a frenzy, and along with the poles and nets, every species of firearm is deployed, he writes. But the most significant of these is an old small swivel cannon, once used in making inroads into the Indian settlements, as he puts it, later deployed for patriotic ceremonies such as Fourth of July celebrations, but now filled with duck shot and fired into the passing columns of pigeons. As Leatherstocking, the main character, as you all know, the Daniel Day-Lewis character in Last of the Mohicans, if you've seen the, the movie, as Leatherstocking observes the scene, he is, quote, able to keep his sentiments to himself until he saw the introduction of the swivel into the sports. But then he objects, quoting now, it's wicked to be shooting into flocks in this wasty manner, to kill 20 and eat one. When I want such a thing, I go into the woods till I find one to my liking, and then I shoot him off the branches without touching the feather of another, though there might be a 100 on the same tree, unquote. In the meantime, he says, taking his leave, quote, I wouldn't touch one of the harmless things that cover the ground here, looking up with their eyes on me as if they only wanted tongues to say their thoughts, unquote. <clears throat> now, much could be said about all the various ethical and political dimensions of this scene, not least of all the use of the patriotic cannon to clear both Indians and pigeons, 
But one of the things that Leatherstocking's response draws our attention to is the difference between multiplicity and singularity that frames the entire story of the passenger pigeon. And more importantly, the contrasting ways of relating to that difference body, bodied forth in the use of the cannon against the flocks, or so-called primitive hordes, so numerous that they are more like swarms of insects versus Leatherstocking's thoughts of having his gaze returned by the individual animal looking up with their eyes on me. Now this image of the birds <coughs> as a kind of superorganism or swarm is an easy mark, I take it, for any armchair Delizian, but I want to return now to the installation and specifically to Martha and ask what resides at the other pole of this configuration, the pole of singularity? What is Martha exactly? A pet? A fetish? A curiosity? A relic? We might say that her captivity display and the giving to her of a proper name all attempt to turn her into these things. But these compensatory gestures only underscore all the more that this is a case of disavowal, not only of our grotesque role in the extinction of her species, perhaps, but also of our own finitude in relation to other forms of life, which calls forth these compensatory, compensatory gestures to curate, you might say, the boundaries between life and death, survival and extinction, all of which is indexed, it seems to me, by the strange fact of giving an exact date to the extinction of an entire species. <clears throat> but in a more real sense, of course, the passenger pigeon, considered as a complex of system environment interactions that evolve over time versus what you might call the simplex of the brute material existence of her body and her DNA, was already extinct bef before Martha died. In our exertion of curatorial power over the life-death boundary on the site of extinction, even to the point of dating it by our calendar and our archive, is driven by the same thing that drives Martha's name. Martha, who was in fact named for George Washington's young widow, her mate George, who died a year earlier, named for the president himself, the epitome of sovereignty itself for the young nation, if ever there was one. But the whole point, of course, is that the passenger pigeon is neither beast nor sovereign. And all of this, in my view, is outed, as it were, in Martha's Peel, <coughs> where we're invited to sit and spin around in the cage, vocalize or play an instrument in memory of Martha's bird song, and draw on the chalk floor as the chalkboard floor as Martha would have rubbed her beak on a chalk block inside the cage, while as we spin, photographic stills from Edward Mybridge's famous series of the passenger pigeon whiz by, perhaps quickly enough to show the bird in flight, creating a kind of spectral reanimation. Is this a process of becoming bird, as the title of the live video projection of the inside of Martha Peel, Martha's Peel suggests? No, nothing could be farther from the truth, I think, because the point is that the birds are already gone, already a part of a historical record <coughs> archived by Mybridge's photographs. We are, to be sure, invited to occupy Martha's space, perhaps to identify with her singularity and isolation by having our attention focused on our own. We are, in short, invited to open the question of the relationship between her finitude, her death, and our own. But in the end, I think, we're back to the question of dwelling, to what constitutes a proper or appropriate form of dwelling and for whom, with whom. Back, in fact, to Leatherstocking's protest, put an end, judge, to your clearings. We're back, that is to say, to something <coughs> Jeffrey talked about. We're back to dwelling and specifically its relation to the eco of ecology via the oikos that links it to the eco of economy, the oikos that marks off and delineates a home inside from outside, is a place where the relation between organism and environment is stabilized, secured, even made calculable and economizable. If the eco of ecology is fatefully linked, as Michael Martyr puts it, to quote, the oikos belonging to the family and standing for property, the proper domus, one's own domain, unquote, then the challenge here is to think what he calls an aneconomic sense of the proper or appropriate dwelling, one divorced from property, the family, the proper name, such as Martha, and finally, from sovereignty itself. <coughs> Part of the conceptual and emotional torque of the piece, in other words, is the irony of Martha's final dwelling, which testifies all the more to the necessity of thinking dwelling otherwise, perhaps as a migratory process, not a process of clearing, as precisely passengers, as we who are passing through. This complex nexus of temporality, dwelling, iterability, and materialization 
is put very much on the front burner by other elements in the installation in the component Eight Voices Before Columbus, which references the names for the passenger pigeon used by the Lenape, Ojibwe, Kaskaskia, Mohawk, Choctaw, Seneca, and Narragansett Indians, where viewers are invited to drop an acorn, a key food source for the pigeon, into the podium after reciting the name of an extinct bird species, which takes us back, <coughs> of course, to our discussion of, Co of Cooper's The Pioneers, and most of all, in the component called Unveiling, the, the glass wall entrance to the gallery on which are printed letters that turn out to be fragments of the mitochondrial genome sequence of the passenger pigeon, supplied by scientist Ben Novak, who is working with the Long Now Foundation in its, in its Revive and Restore program, headed, interestingly enough, by Stuart Brand of Whole Earth Catalog and Coevolution Quarterly fame, to bring back the passenger pigeon as part of a larger de-extinction process. The complex, and this is ser very serious, <coughs> if you want to find out more about it, there's an, actually an entire TED uh, conference about de-extinction you can, you can look at on the internet, on YouTube. The complexities of the de-extinction process, let alone the debates about its viability and ethics, are far too detailed to go, in here, go into here, but even its proponents realize that, in contrast to magically going backwards in time via genetics, a time loop that's related in a very interesting way to the palindrome of Peel's foe, there are other slower and more multidimensional temporalities at work here in the environmental factors affecting morphology and development, in the processes of imprinting, social learning and communication, and much else besides. In other words, as Christopher Johnson puts it, quote, code is both regulating before, but also regulated after, in the sense that the program is executed in a context that is perpetually changing, unquote. And what this means is that DNA is a, quote, relational determined part of a whole developmental system, unquote, as so much recent work in epigenetics has demonstrated. The danger inherent <coughs> in this new script of life, as Julian Murphy terms it in relation to de-extinction efforts around the woolly mammoth, is that, quote, it has nothing to do with the molar form or the representational shape of the creature and everything to do with parcelized units of production on the one hand and strings of mappable code on the other. Two correlated models of futurity, he continues, are implicit in this new script, the implicit eternity of the market and the promise of species revival whose innermost impulse is simply the infinite manipul manipulability of life itself, unquote. That is to say, in the terms I used earlier, curatorial control over what Derrida calls the life-death relation. This question, <coughs> this is my last page, this question is certainly in play in Pestle's wall of genetic code, and there's also much to be said about glass and windows here, both the architectural innovation and the computer operating system in relation to processes of visualization and capture that I can't go into at the moment. But I'd like to see in Pestle's unveiling an agnostic, if not indeed cautionary note in this regard, one that reaches back, <coughs> and again, I can't make the full argument here, to Marcel Duchamp, Duchamp's concept of delay at work in his famous piece, The Large Glass, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors, which is alluded to in Mel Chen's early piece, Bird in a Cage, which is in fact a portrait of Martha on glass and one that explicitly references Duchamp's concept of delay, with Martha, of course, in the position of the bride. Think back to Martha and George. Pestle's glass, in other words, holds out to us <coughs> the prospect that the passenger pigeon may yet live again, that we can somehow undo what we've done, and yet cautions us not to look at the species or Martha through a shop window that too, e that too easily links genetic code, market, time, and what we call life. And in its foregrounding of time-based performance and improvisation, the installation is itself, fa in fact, neither a code nor a script, but as Derrida might say, a space in which those script what those scripts can produce is as promising and unpredictable for better or for worse as life and death itself. Thank you. That was an incredibly rich keynote. Thank you very much. I feel like there are feathers of questions yeah. flying around the room right now. Um, a lot to take in. It's a lot to take in, and I very much appreciate the, the lead out to other possible questions, other possible uh, arguments that can be taken from this.
which perhaps we might want to even address right now, but if there are any pressing questions immediately after the presentation that was just made. It's nice and warm in here now. <laughs> That's for sure. Any questions so far? Uh, maybe just one. Yeah. I did sure. watch the, the TED Talk about the extinction, yeah. and I found it really, really interesting. Yeah. I would really highly recommend it. Please watch Stuart Brand's video on the extinction, if not all of them. I think it's kind of like with YouTube, once you start watching one, you just keep going and going, and then it's four in the morning. Um, I'm just curious about what you think in terms of the passenger pigeon and the de-extinction process, because I believe their first subject of study is to bring back the passenger pigeon. I think other groups are working on the woolly mammoth, but Stuart mm -hmm. Brand's focus is on the passenger pigeon, and he highlights some of the positive qualities of the argument, the negative qualities of the argument, and I'm just curious in terms of the environment in terms of passing through as a space of yeah. Well, I don't. I, I, I'm actually kind of agnostic about the de, the whole de-extinction thing, and I think it's very much a, I think it's very much a case by case issue. Um, I mean, one thing you'll see if you watch if you watch Ben Novak talk about it, um, he's more aware than anybody of the fact that actually the easy part is the genetic part of making this happen. Um, and the hard part is figuring out, okay, once we've, once we've introduced uh, a viable offspring into a, a closely related species of pigeon and we have that, then the really complicated work begins um, in terms of kind of, you know, proportionate learning, how are these birds going to learn what they need to know in terms of where to migrate, not to go to the same place every year, you know, are the forests still intact, so on. You know, those, those kinds of questions that are actually far more complex than can we do the stuff in the lab. So, so you know, he's, he's aware of that. And one point he makes about the reason the passenger pigeon is at the top of the list is that a lot of those behaviors that in, in other species of birds require um, really complicated forms of learning, a lot of those behaviors in passenger pigeons are actually pretty hardwired. So that makes the passenger pigeon kind of a good, a good candidate. So. I mean, I think, I think Julian Murphy's, uh, you know, cautions that I quote at the end of the paper are, are spot on. Um, but, I, but I don't have a, I, I would never sort of have a, a, a kind of a blanket Luddite, you know, sort of attitude toward de-extinction um, as being, you know, universally bad. I really think it is a case-by-case -case, um, situation. And of, course, and, of course, it's a situation that's always going to include uh, you know, what Kenneth, I mean, it's part of my point in the talk, is, is going to include what Kenneth Burke calls unintended byproducts. So, <laughs> you know, but I mean, that's, that's the case anyway. So, I mean, the passage I would refer you to here that's important to me is, is actually Derrida's discussion of uh, cloning uh, in rogues and also in uh, the Beast and the Sovereign seminars, which I think is a very intelligent, um, a very intelligent um, confrontation with this question. Or, or a version of this question. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. No, I mean, this, there, this is kind of a massive guilt thing that's really the, the motor, the psychic motor, I think, for de-extinction. Um, and even when you watch Stuart Brand talk about I mean, he actually almost starts crying at a certain point when he's talking about bringing back the passenger pigeon. So it's a, it's, there's a lot of guilt, you know, actually not even under the surface, I think, that's driving the whole de-extinction process. I mean I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right and some, something that you, I mean the first part of your question and something you touched on in, in you know, the talk that you gave in your panel uh, was that you know, there, there are many different forms of violence toward non-human creatures 
um, including making live, as Foucault puts it. Um, and I think, I, think, I, think one, I think one value that I tried to draw out in Before the Law of bringing to bear the biopolitical framework is that it draws out how, how, how the relationship between violence and forms of life is actually a complex and very multidimensional uh, imbrication that we're, that we're stuck in the middle of, in, including what Derrida calls, you know, the predication of what we think of as, as, as normal life on a massive and systematic letting die um, of, of both human and non-human um, forms of life for, for which the species distinction actually is not, is, is not a constitutive distinction, right? I mean, that's p the par part of, to me, part of the value of the biopolitical framework is to show that, you know, the, the, is the issue is not human-animal. <laughs> that's, that's far too blunt an instrument to make sense of um, the fact that you have to start by at least conjugating human-slash-animal bios-slash-zoe for starters, and then begin to think about um, how these different forms of violence that are qualitatively different affect different um, sorts of species. So no, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. And you know, the, 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 idea that, the idea that bringing back the passenger pigeon is like somehow gonna make us feel better about factory farming is dumb. Yeah, so no, I, th I think that's a great question, yeah. back here so you can hear. Um, I'm using poetics precisely in the sense Jeffrey referenced in his talk, um, which is as a making. And, and one of the, as, as you know if you've read my work, one of the reasons I'm, tra I'm attracted to deconstruction and systems theory, and I think it's necessary to cross-conjugate cross those, is to make it clear that um, poesis in this sense, or poetics in this sense, is not in the least bit limited to what we call language um, or human language. So, so langu language is um, a second order phenomenon that arises um, in evolutionary terms within a much broader domain of communication and meaning that's not limited at all to the use of words. That doesn't mean that the use of words is not something unique and special. It is something unique and special but it takes place within a much, a much broader, much more complex domain of communication um, that involves all different kinds of poesis or all different kinds of making, including the use of various kinds of codes in laboratories, right, in the manipulation of life. And so, and so you know, the person who was important to me early on in this that I actually read as an undergraduate is actually Gregory Bateson in uh, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. You know, Bateson, Bateson has this great moment in one of his essays where he says, uh, he says, you know, if a guy says to a girl, I love you, she would be a lot smarter to pay attention to his respiratory rate and his body language and the dilation of his pupils than to the denotative content of his words. And what Bateson's simply drawing out, and, and of course, in, in, in mammalian evolutionary terms, a lot of those aspects of our communication are involuntary, right? Um, Bateson said, this is one reason we don't trust actors, <laughs> you know? Um, and, so, and so there's all kinds of stuff going on in human communication of which the use of words and the use of language is, is, is one but only one dimension. And so, and so uh, Maturana and Varela, for instance, talk about the emergence of linguistic domains in, in which is not limited to human beings, which is not yet language proper, but has a lot to do with the phenomenological life worlds that we associate with, with being able to do things like use words, right? So, so that one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm using this term in the sense that Jeffrey uh, referenced is that that sense, once you've said everything I've just said, 
you, you've got a way to connect um, the use of code and technology biopolitically in relation to life with the question of the use of words and signification in this more limited sense. So, so poesis is happening here, but in the Wallace Stevens material, you know, it's more in the domain that you're referencing, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I, th I mean, I think we're, I think we're doing both. You know, we're, we're both resurrecting and inventing. Um, the point I was trying to make earlier is that I actually don't think the species category is constitutive of any of these problematics. And, and this to me, again, is the value of the biopolitical, the biopolitical framework, right? So one of the things I argue in Before the Law is, you know, if, if, you, look at, if you look at how um, pigs and cows are treated in factory farming, um, and you look at how the pet industry in North America is this, is this mega industry, I don't even know. I don't even know what the, the, the value of it is at this point, but it, but the number is crazy. And you look at the fact that probably a lot of the dogs and cats of people in this room, biopolitically, um, have access to a better quality of life than many millions of the world's human inhabitants, right? So the difference between the cow and the factory farm, or the pig and the factory farm, and your golden retriever you know, is, is big, but it's not nearly that big to countenance the fact that one, one creature's treated one way and one creature's treated the other way. I mean, your, dog is treat, your dog's treated the way he's treated, not in, not in spite of the fact that he's an animal, but because he's an animal, right? This thing we call a companion animal. And so, and so whatever's going on here, the constitutive distinction is not human-animal, <laughs> right? It's actually a biopolitical parsing um, by the introduction of what Foucault, Foucault calls caesuras in the biological continuum that allow some forms of life, human or animal, to be killed or be allowed to die, and other forms of life, human or animal, to enjoy a historically unprecedented access to a quality of life, health care, I'm even with animals now, veterinary care, and in fact, um, medical insurance, that you know, many, many millions of the Earth's you know, human population don't have access to. So, so whatever's happening here, I don't think species, I mean, I think the value of the biopolitical framework is to remind us that you can't talk about biopolitics without talking about race, but you can't talk about race without talking about species, but then you have to realize species is actually not constitutive of what we're talking about here. Some, something else is going on, right? So it's a much more, I think it's a much more complex field of biopolitical effectivity that we're talking about here, that for which the vocabulary human animal, I mean, it's just a, it's kind of a waste of time, actually, you know. But, it, but it's the vocabulary we inherit, and we have to try to undo and redescribe, so...
have a guided tour for some people who really <laughs> enjoy going on a guided tour, and I don't want to have to have many more if you go. It should be really interesting. Um, so I just want to thank Professor Clay Wolf again for coming to speak with us.